I needed an affordable bookshelf, so I decided to go to IKEA. Like many large global companies, IKEA is trying to be environmentally and socially responsible at a worldwide level, but at a local level, how IKEA needs to enact these responsibilities is based on the norms and attitudes found in the city, plus IKEA's ability to make a fat profit. In this video, I'm going to show how I assembled an understanding of my city's urbanism through a trip to IKEA on my cargo bike. First, I'll show how IKEA has fully embraced the attitude in my city and most of North America that car dependency is great. Second, I'll show how the trip to IKEA demonstrates how urbanism degrades in my city as I ride my cargo bike from the older, more walkable central part of my city to the car dependent suburbs where IKEA is located. So, let's first look at where IKEA has chosen to locate its store. If we look at IKEA in less car dependent countries, we see store locations that are less car dependent than the one in my city. Here's the IKEA in Vienna. It's one of their small, urban format stores. There's actually one in Toronto as well. These urban format stores are centrally located with lots of biking and transit options. There looks to be little, if any, dedicated parking just for IKEA. The more traditional stores are big boxes with enough parking, but their urbanism isn't too bad in places that value that sort of thing. The IKEA in Utrecht has covered its parking with two soccer pitches and biking and transit is nearby. Outside Stuttgart, the IKEA has a compact parkade around the back with biking and transit right in front. It's not all great from an urbanist perspective though. Here's an IKEA in Amsterdam. There's a large parking lot in the front, but there are also transit stops and bike lanes all around. However, IKEA in my city takes car dependency to a whole new level. Don't let the name outside fool you. This is the oldest image in Street View I could find of where IKEA used to be located in my city. The image is from 2009 and IKEA had moved out in 2003. In my estimation, Etc. is not powerful enough to have the outside of the former largest mall in the world covered in that distinctive blue. But IKEA was probably paying, in its opinion, too much rent for too little floor space. There should have been enough parking as the mall is surrounded by the world's largest parking lot. IKEA upped its car dependency though by moving to Canada's largest power centre. Oddly, the old IKEA was just one kilometre closer to downtown by bike than the new IKEA, but the old IKEA would have been more accessible by bike or transit. Westad was built in the early 1980s and is surrounded by residential neighbourhoods. South Edmonton Common opened in 1998 and is a leapfrog greenfield development surrounded by freeways and industrial developments. So both IKEA locations in my city completely embraced local attitudes about car dependency, despite IKEA having a different attitude globally. But that's enough spoiler video showing what it's like to ride around IKEA. Let's find out what you can learn about a city's bikeability through its expansion history. We can learn this by riding from the city's core out to IKEA in the suburbs. Our journey begins in one of the oldest parts of the city. The walkability is good and the university is nearby so the proportion of people walking and biking is amongst the highest in the city. Despite being in a walkable area, the bike lane is on a quieter street, which makes it a bit more of an urban freeway than something you would take to get to your destination. The city should be discouraging driving in this area by putting protected bike lanes on main roads, but city of Min hates to inconvenience drivers. I'm not going to critique design elements of the bike lane. The purpose of this video is to show how the quality of the bike lane corresponds to the car dependency of the neighborhood, so it's sufficient to say that this is the best bike infrastructure in the city, and this is probably the most walkable area in the city. This small section reinforces that the city is still planning mostly for SUVs. The approach to this intersection wasn't great, as the bike lane is used to protect a half block worth of parking, and then there's this terrible bit of design. Coloring the bike lane and sidewalk grey, and a more different grey, respectively, isn't clear enough for some people, even with the big bike symbol. Also, the parking meter was installed in the bike lane, and oriented so people have to stand further into the bike lane to operate the machine. That weird stretch of bike lane was done just to preserve five parking spots. We've now entered our next section. The neighborhood was built in the 1950s and 60s, so the roads are still in the grid system and SUV dependence has slightly increased. There is no mix of residential and commercial uses other than some small strip malls. Residential density has also decreased. The proportion of people biking is still relatively high, 
so building a protected bike lane is justified by the metrics. This bike lane was part of the earliest protected bike lanes installed in my city around 10 years ago. It is only meant to be an urban freeway to take you through the neighborhood since the mentality of my city and of neoliberalism in general is that the only important people riding bikes are commuters going to work. The narrowness of the lanes reinforces this since it is impossible to ride side by side. This limits the social aspect of riding with others. The chicanes show that parking SUVs is more important than good bike infrastructure. This and other bike lanes in the area faced a huge fight over parking. All of the houses seen in this part of the video must have three or four parking spots on the property. Yet, it seems nearly everyone thinks the public road in front of their house is their private property solely for the storage of their private SUVs. As we enter the next section of the city, the quality of the bike infrastructure has taken a huge step down. You can see a painted bike gutter appear and disappear. Sections where there's no painted bike gutter are marked as a sharrow. Sharrows are more dangerous for people on bikes than nothing at all. We're still in a part of the city that's old enough to use the grid system, but we're getting far enough from downtown that people are less likely to commute by bike. However, the bike infrastructure suddenly improves. The neighborhood is undergoing renewal. The city just replaces the roads and sidewalks during renewal, but one community wanted more walkability. They wanted more walkable infrastructure installed during the renewal. They had to fight the city for this, but they won. So, if a community organizes and lobbies the city, it can receive bike lanes and continuous sidewalks. But, you can still notice the SUV dependency the city prefers. The new bike lane takes space away from the grassy boulevard instead of the road. I should note at this point that my city has been getting a lot of attention over how much money it plans to spend on bike infrastructure in the near future. Because this brand new bike infrastructure is not much more than a wide sidewalk, I'm quite concerned about how all the proposed active transportation money might be spent. Also, I'd like to point out That's that I read in the quote. city's documents on this construction that people walking and biking were supposed to be able to pass through this area during construction. If I hadn't read that, I wouldn't have tried continuing on this road, as there are no clear signs indicating that people can still pass through. And yes, you will see brand new poles placed right in the middle of the brand new sidewalk. The neighborhood renewal is a piecemeal process, so the quality of the bike infrastructure can go up and down. We've now crossed outside of the inner ring road of the city. We're now in about the 1980s, so the curvilinear streets will start soon. Residential housing no longer faces the main street. You'll see backs of houses and fences from now on. On this road, you can almost see where a bike lane used to be. This bike lane was installed in about 2015, but ripped out in 2018. Despite maintaining four lanes for SUVs and very little residential or commercial uses fronting this road, there were complaints about a bike lane being there. It was the usual that the city paints substandard infrastructure, people don't feel safe using it, other people complain it isn't being used enough. We don't have metrics about how many SUVs have to be seen on a road or else it'll be removed, but my city will unofficially have such metrics for bike infrastructure. The low usage is due to being in a very SUV dependent part of the city. Oops, my mistake. There are some small stretches where houses face the street. Again, all of these houses have, by law, three or four parking spots on the property, likely as a garage accessible from the back alley.
and the painted bike gutter is back. If you actually thought this protected you, but wouldn't ride where it was missing, you'd have a hard time route finding. You'd probably have given up by now and driven to Ikea. And now we have a painted door zone. Notice the high demand for street parking along this stretch, which keeps the bike lane out closer to speeding SUVs. Okay, nearly there. We've arrived at a major arterial road. We're now in the 1990s. We're out of the grid system and onto a circular road system. The arterial roads are big and wide. There are taller fences and more green space to try and reduce noise. However, there's somehow only room for about a 2.5 meter sidewalk. My city has designated this sidewalk as a shared use path. That's usually their strategy when it's way too dangerous to have people on bikes on the arterial roads. Just designate the closest sidewalk as a shared use path and it's all good. You'll notice I missed the sign so I crossed the street three times. I did consider riding on the slightly narrower sidewalk on the other side of the street, as it's not really clear where I should be riding. I'll also pull out my phone soon as the roads approaching Ikea are rather confusing. I still intend to do a video about how Google is a barrier to biking. Google is telling me to take that flyover to the left. That's a very high stress route very few sane people would ride a bike on. We're finally in the power center. The next intersection is actually the designated bike route. I don't know why, as the sidewalk is exactly the same as the one beside me now, and the road is even busier. I took it on my way home, and it was rather unpleasant. This road seems quiet enough for me. I don't see anything I would call biking infrastructure anywhere in the power center, and you'll barely see anyone on the sidewalks. This is complete SUV dependence. There's even lots of traffic congestion, because SUVs are the only encouraged option to get here. On the way home, I resisted the urge to take the sidewalk when it took five light cycles to get through one intersection. And just to make sure I understand that no one is expected to ride a bike here, I could only find one bike rack near the corner of the building. Someone even locked their gas-powered moped to the rack, nearly blocking it entirely. So where I live, one small bike rack blocked by a moped is all you need to demonstrate a commitment to sustainable transportation. It is the only building with solar panels on the roof in the entire power center, so I guess it's met its ESG goals. And thanks for watching. I hope I was able to show how bike infrastructure degrades and my city encourages more use of SUVs as you get into newer areas further from the old core. For someone with less biking experience or less able to handle traffic stress, riding to Ikea would not be possible. Of course, the ride was easier than putting the bookshelf together. Please consider liking the video and leave a comment if you've tried biking to big box centers in the suburbs. And as always, don't forget to recycle the packaging.